Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Stacey Satung with the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is titled, the, Util the Utility Moratorium is Ending Soon, What You Need to Know. To let you all know and keep you informed, this presentation is being recorded and will run approximately 60 minutes, including question and answer time. Additionally, please note any information that comes across in the chat does get saved. We will send you a link to this recording and webinar within a few days, as well as upload it to our YouTube channel and our brand new website. Attendees, you all will be muted during the presentation. If you have questions for the presenters, please type them in the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. If you have a logistical question for myself or other Housing Alliance staff, please use the chat feature for that. The chat feature should not be used for questions for the presenters. Those should go in the Q&A box. I'll now turn it over to Brian Buss to kick off our presentation today. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us uh, with this really important topic uh, about the utility moratorium. We have a very exciting uh, webinar for you. It is a follow-up from our first webinar, which was in October, uh, October 27th in uh, 2020 and then February 2nd, uh, 21, really talking about what are some of the protections around um, folks that may have uh, their utilities um, coming to uh, a possible shutoff notice. So uh, I would like to introduce our panel today. Uh, first, there is um, Elizabeth Marks. She is the executive director of the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project. We also have Madeline Keaton, who is um, from the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project, and she is the Energy Justice Coordinator. And then we also have Kentasia Scott. She's a staff attorney uh, at, at the Energy Unit of the Community Legal Services. And with that, I shall um, turn it over, I believe, to Maddie. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and start this presentation off. Good afternoon, happy Tuesday. Again, this presentation is about the ending of the utility moratorium and what you need to know. We're planning on running until one o'clock p.m. So if there are any questions that don't end up getting answered, we will be sure to respond via email and give you our contact information if you have any follow-ups. So to start off, just a welcome and some introductions. Uh, I'm sure most of you already know who the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania is. They advocate for resources and provide trainings like this to communities, and they represent a network of organizations, including housing developers, local government, and people with lived experience. Uh, and they directly serve those in need of affordable housing across the state. And then we have my organization, the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project. We are a member of the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network. We're one of the statewide specialty projects focused on utilities. So we represent the interests of low-income residential utility consumers across the state. And we also do trainings like this and provide support to other legal aid and nonprofit community groups across the state. We also have with us today Community Legal Services, also a member of the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network. And CLS is situated in Philadelphia, so they serve low-income Philadelphia families and organizations. Uh, and today we have two attorneys here with us from the Energy Unit. Just a brief agenda, we are going to do a quick review of some of the utility assistance programs. We're going to talk about termination and reconnection strategies. We're going to talk a bit about tenant utility rights. And then we're going to share some resources and have a time for Q&A. Uh, so again, as Stacy mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, if you have any questions uh, for the presenters in particular, please make sure to put them in the Q&A box. 
And if you have any logistical questions for Housing Alliance staff, you can put that right in the chat. So first, just an overview of the current status of the moratorium. Uh, every year there is annual protection against shutoff during the winter. So this means from December 1st to March 31st, your electric, gas, and heat-related water service cannot be shut off uh, if your income is at or below 250% of the federal poverty level. So this happens every year. It doesn't have anything to do with the current pandemic. Uh, however, there is an additional moratorium in place currently because of the pandemic. Uh, if you are a protected customer, that means that your income is at or below 300% of the federal poverty level and you've applied for all available assistance programs and have requested a payment arrangement, you also cannot be shut off. Uh, and this is also set to end on the same date, March 31st, 2021. So as of April 1st, there were, will no longer be any prohibition on utility terminations. So taking a look at the current situation communities across our state are in when it comes to upcoming terminations. As of February 2021, and these are the most recent numbers, we have over 800,000 residential utility accounts that were at risk of termination. And we are also at 852 million in regulated utility debt, which is up 44% year over year. Uh, so these numbers are showing that there is clearly a serious need uh, for assistance and for help and that many families across our Commonwealth are, are really struggling with their utility bills. And this is of particular importance, especially to housing folks, because utility terminations can lead to eviction. Uh, it can lead to a loss of public housing benefits. Uh, it can lead to, uh, you know, children in the family being taken away. It can lead to liens being placed on a homeowner, homeowner's property. And of course, it really just makes a home unlivable, especially in the midst of this pandemic when we're all sheltering at home. You know, if you don't have water to wash your hands and, and keep things sanitized, you know, how are you going to stay protected? Um, so these are really, really serious consequences. And, and we all know how intimately tied utilities are to, to having a healthy and safe home. So the CDC eviction moratorium was extended to June 30th, but this does not stop evictions if utilities are terminated. So this is a key thing to remember. Uh, despite the fact that the eviction moratorium has been extended, uh, this does not stop eviction if utilities are terminated in the rental property. And it's also important to note that utility moratoriums nationwide have been shown to reduce COVID-19 infection rates by 4.4% and reduce mortality rates by 7.4%. Um, you know, so these moratoriums have really been saving lives and we're really grateful that we've had the moratorium present in Pennsylvania for as long as we have. So this is just a brief list of some of the utility assistance programs we'll be going over today. We're going to talk about the Emergency Rental and Utility Assistance Program, or ERAP. We're going to be talking about Customer Assistance Programs, or CAP. We're going to talk about Hardship Funds. And we're going to talk a bit about Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP. Uh, the the rest on the list, we're not going to go into as much detail about, but they're important to be aware of if you're not already. Uh, so there are energy efficiency programs like FlyERP. There are referral and evaluation services that utility companies offer. And of course, there are also local sort of county level, community level assistance programs and, and small pots of funding and help that can be found through churches and local nonprofits as well as some other additional federal programs. So there's really lots of different types of assistance that can be found anywhere from the local to the federal level. And so we're, we're hopeful that some of the information we'll be provided, providing you with today um, will help make you aware of some of the details of these programs a bit further. And so now I'm going to turn it to my colleague, Elizabeth Marks. Hi everyone, um, welcome, good to see in the 
the attendees so many uh, uh, names that I recognize, people I know. Thanks for joining today. Um, uh, and thanks, Maddie, for uh, uh, that uh, overview. I'm going to talk a little bit first about the Emergency Rental and Utility Assistance Program. Um, unfortunately, the name itself is a bit confusing, um, but even if you're not behind on your rent and don't need rental assistance, you can still receive utility assistance. So many of you know these programs, and I know from looking at the list of who is here um, that some of you are actually administering this program. Um, so wonderful, um, and you know, uh, type in the chat if I get something wrong. Um, uh, but as far as eligibility goes, so I'm going to give you the basics and then I'm going to give you a couple of um, uh, things we're seeing and, and tips as uh, to move through this program. Um, but first, eligibility, 80% of area median income. This is going to be a different um, standard for everybody that is uh, for every county um, and DHS, the, the, the hyperlink in there when you actually get a copy of this PowerPoint um, can go directly to the chart that uh, DHS put together for the area median income standards. Um, you also have to have a reduction in income, incurred substantial expenses, or experienced a financial hardship due to COVID-19. Um, as far as utilities go, um, just about every person who has stayed in their home through the pandemic has seen an increase in utility costs and other basic living expenses, particularly for low-income households and fixed-income households. This has come at an extreme hardship. They're using more water than ever before. They're using more energy than ever before because they're home more than ever before, and they're not going out and using public restrooms while they're you know at work or at school or shopping or uh, any of the other things that kind of help share the, the load of, uh, of utility services. So arguably, um, you know, just about all of the families that we'll be working with to avoid termination have incurred substantial costs, at least as far as their utilities go. They also have to be risk at risk of housing instability and homelessness. And of course, as Maddie just uh, explained, um, the inability to keep utility services on in your home creates housing instability. It also is often an immediate trigger to homelessness. Um, it will, you know, families then double up when they can't have uh, safe and affordable utility services connected to their home. Um, and so it certainly does create housing instability. So what can it pay for? It can pay for rent. I'm not going to get into the, the housing stuff. I'm not a housing expert. I'm a utility expert. Um, but as far as utilities go, uh, this program can pay for utility and home energy costs, including electric, gas, water, sewer, trash, deliverable fuels. Um, that's a pretty long list, right, of various types of utilities. We understand that some uh, counties have put restrictions um, on the number of utilities they'll cover. Um, that's nowhere in the state or federal law, so we encourage those counties to remove those restrictions um, because one of the big points here is there's a lot of money that Pennsylvania has to spend or we send back, or the counties just lose it to another county that is spending it more on their folks. Um, so the key is we've got to get this funding out to those who need it um, and we got to get it out quickly. Just a note about broadband and telecommunication services. There was some conflicting guidance from the Treasury early on about not being able to use the utility assistance for broadband and telecommunications. That guidance has since been changed um, and guidance from DHS now allows um, uh, the other direct or indirect expenses to include uh, funding for broadband or telecommunications if people needed that to, to keep um, access in their uh, to utility service in their home. So I'll cover briefly in a couple of minutes um, that uh, you know we are expecting to get a lot more money uh, through the American Rescue Plan. Um, I saw an estimate that I've stuck in here. It's not a final number, but we believe there's about 671 million in additional funding for the Ameri from the American Rescue Plan for this program. Uh, so again, um, you know the the key here is let's get this out as quickly as possible. Um, can we move to the next slide, Maddie? 
uh, and we do have two questions that came through in the chat that are relevant here and I'll leave this annual income limit up I only did a screen grab of that share so you could see generally what the income guidelines are they're going to be a lot higher than what they are for um, a lot of the other uh, assistance programs that we'll talk about um, two questions here were are homeowners eligible and are people who are literally homeless el uh, eligible um, and uh, homeowners are not eligible. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the homeowner uh, funding that's coming through the American Rescue Plan. Um, and uh, if you are homeless, you're not, you don't have a rental obligation right now, um, so you wouldn't be eligible to help pay for um, missed utilities unless, uh, you know, and that's it's an interesting question whether or not you could um, apply if somebody was made homeless through the pandemic as a result of some of these bills whether or not you could pay. I'm not actually sure the answer to that question, so we'll have to look into that. Um, uh, if we can go to the next slide. So a little bit about applications. And uh, as Pennsylvania is Pennsylvania, we have 67 counties and 67 different ways of doing things. Um, but about 40 counties have joined into DHS's Compass um, application. So that is standardized. But anybody who's applying for the program could go to Compass. And if their county is administered through another website um, or has a separate application, uh, they can go through Compass as a central location and be referred to the right county program uh, to apply, um, or they can just proceed with applying right on Compass. Right now, there's no ability to submit um, an application uh, and documentation to follow up via Compass, but as I understand it, when you apply for Compass right now, at the end of your application, it will direct you how and where to submit your documentation. Um, if your county's not using Compass, that website, uh, of course, will be available. Um, we do understand DHS is working on some upgrades to Compass to allow people to submit documentation um, through Compass, and so that functionality should be available soon. Um, uh, and again, as I mentioned before, the homeowner assistance uh, funding is coming, but right now that's a big gap where there's there's no programming um, right now apart from what existed prior to the pandemic, which will cover some of those programs. Um, but really, we need we need to work on getting those homeowner uh, programs up and running because a lot of homeowners are going to be at risk of um, you know liens being attached to their property and uh, potential um, other consequences as a result. Can we go to the next slide? Couple things to watch out for. I already mentioned the first one, which is that if people had a increased utility usage during the pandemic, this should be sufficient to prove the household incurred substantial costs. Um, I'd also recommend those of you who are working in the field, um, who are assisting consumers, um, even if you're a, a county administrator of one of these programs, if you're a utility, it is critical that there be clear lines of communication developed between the program administrators and the utilities. Um, we are seeing in some counties that there's, the, you know, where there's not lines of communication, there's no clear process, and that's hanging up the ability to get assistance out. So we really highly recommend that county administrators reach out to utilities, vice versa. If you're having trouble uh, locating or connecting with a utility um, and you're a program administrator, give us a call. Um, all of the utilities uh, that we partner with are anxious to talk to program administrators um, across the board, whether it's the large regulated utilities or the smaller unregulated utilities. Another important hitch to watch out for is that um, we uh, don't believe that a, if somebody enters a payment agreement, this should not be a barrier to getting utility assistance to pay for that back bill. Um, this is a, a you know a, a contention that we're currently trying to work out, um, but you know essentially people are entering a lot of payment arrangements that they just can't afford to pay um, in order to stop 
uh, a termination from going through, right? So they enter a payment arrangement, they fall very quickly behind again. Um, so we're hopeful that the, the counties are not putting up that barrier for people to access assistance if they have a payment arrangement. Um, another important a piece is to ask the utility to delay termination if you have an application pending, um, right? So the utility doesn't know if you've applied, if it's being processed at the county level. So reaching out to um, the uh, utility provider and saying this person has applied for the ERAP program, um, please, you know, can you put a, a stay on the, the termination until that application goes through? Um, that's a great way to advocate for consumers who are facing an immediate shutoff um, because this program won't help if we can't get the dollars out before the services are terminated. Last, you know, one of the pieces we recommend is snap a photo, right, of the completed application um, and make make note of what date you applied. Um, this is, is good practice for all of these programs um, because things happen, right? Uh, there's humans on the other end that are processing um, most of these types of applications. And so you don't want yours to be at the bottom of the pile, particularly when terminations are pending and will move faster than the relief May, uh, come. Um, and finally, uh, if you're seeing issues with a program or barriers, uh, we really want to hear about it, particularly with regard to utilities. I can't guarantee there'll be anything we can do to help, um, but we are tracking those issues. We're talking with DHS regularly about them, um, and we're hopeful to solve as many of them as possible. Maddie, can we go to the next slide? So the other programs I'm going to talk about uh, with regard to utilities are more dependent on the federal poverty level, which is a different uh, standard for poverty. So just wanted to make sure you had those numbers. Of course, uh, many of them are 150% of the poverty level. So we're looking at a, a lower income customer group um, eligible for many of the next programs. Customer assistance programs. Um, I hope you all know and remember from our other webinars um, uh, over the years, not just this year, uh, but the customer assistance programs are run by the electric and gas companies and a couple of the water companies, Pennsylvania American Water, um, uh, Aqua and uh, Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority all have uh, customer assistance programs. The Philadelphia Water Department also has a customer assistance program. Um, the water programs are a little different. They aren't quite the same standards as I'll go over with the electric and gas. Um, but the electric and gas programs all uh, have generally the same benefits, though they're often called a different name. So they're going to be CAP or Lyra or CRP or PCAP. You'll see all or on track. You'll see all those names across the state, depending on your utility. And generally, they offer uh, a monthly, um, a lower monthly payment that's targeted at an affordable level. Uh, they give past. Uh, uh, the past debt when you enter the program is frozen and then it becomes eligible for forgiveness over time as people make payments on their discounted bill. Um, so it's got a really good arrearage management component to help people catch up on those bills. Eligibility is generally 150% of the poverty level. And I'll note that utilities can ask for a social security number, but it is not required in order to participate. There's no uh, you know, citizenship requirement for these programs. Um, some utilities do require an applicant to be payment troubled, but that is pretty rare uh, that those are left anymore. It used to be more that people had to be behind before they could enroll in CAP. There's been a recognition that if you have income that is at or below 150% of the poverty level, you are generally going to need assistance to pay for utility services. Um, a couple of notes about CAP to keep in mind is uh, generally uh, CAP uh, participants are in it eligible for payment arrangements um, uh, if they fall behind on their CAP bill. Um, so it's really important to catch up with that CAP bill. But on the flip side, if somebody is, is in CAP and it has a pending termination, they generally don't need to pay all of what's owed, meaning 
all any debt accrued while they were in cap plus any of their the debt that was frozen when they entered cap they generally have a catch-up amount that they need to pay which would be their past missed cap bills so always ask if there's a lesser amount that the client could pay to stay in cap and avoid termination can we go to the next slide just a quick note on hardship funds. Uh, most of the large electric, gas, and water companies have hardship funds, which offer grant assistance. Um, there generally needs to be some good faith payment requirement, meaning the recent payments have been made, um, and generally the grant needs to be able to resolve that termination. So um, like all of these programs, I'd recommend you contact the utility for more information about the specifics. Um, lie heap um, we are uh, 11 days from the scheduled close of lie heap so if you're working with low-income people that haven't accessed lie heap yet or are, have been behind on their bills they absolutely should apply for lie heap now before the program closes um, it may be extended um, but there's no guarantee yet and no commitment made to extend that program um, we do expect to see uh, about $260 million more come into the state for LIHEAP assistance, but it's unclear whether that program will open anytime soon to spend that additional money coming through the American Rescue Plan. Um, so uh, we've provided webinars in the past. There's a link in the, the PowerPoint on LIHEAP. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on LIHEAP. Um, you know, the information is in the slide. There's cash grants. There's crisis grants if you uh, have a pending termination. And then there's also emergency furnace repair um, and, and line repair that if people don't have operational um, systems, they should uh, reach out for that assistance. Um, we are getting into the, war the warmer season, so, uh, you know, but now's the time to fix your furnace if it wasn't operational um, before. Uh, so, recommend everybody get into LIHEAP as soon as possible. And the last thing I'll say about this to keep in mind is, even if somebody isn't paying the utility directly, if they have a home heating responsibility through their rent, meaning they pay their um, landlord for rent, um, they are eligible for LIHEAP. So the vast majority of people that you're going to be working with um, in the field are likely LIHEAP eligible in some way if they have some responsibility either through their lease or directly with the utility for heat. Um, and there's some restrictions here spelled out, but again, I'd recommend you, you uh, watch our other webinar for more details on the LIHEAP program. Can we go to the next slide? All right, Lifeline and Broadband. Um, so Lifeline is a program that not a lot of people know about. Um, it is uh, provides a, a subsidy. Lot, many people refer to it as their Obama phone, which I never understood where that came from because the Lifeline program was around a lot longer than Obama was around. <laughs> um, uh, but it provides a monthly subsidy for telephone, broadband, or bundled service, meaning both your broadband and telephone. It's not a huge subsidy, but some plot providers, telecom providers, will provide free service with that subsidy. So uh, essentially, they're getting a free phone with, um, uh, you know, a, they just take the $9.25 subsidy and then offer that service um, without any additional charge. Sometimes there's adders that people can have, um, but essentially, you know, that's the benefit. It's not a huge benefit, right? If any of you pay a broadband and a telephone bill, you know um, it's a lot more expensive than 925, um, but it is something. Um, the guidelines for eligibility are here, 135% of the poverty level, and then there's categorical eligibility for a number of different programs that people may be in. Um, it is limited to one subsidy per household. Um, but the big program that's also coming um, is that there's 3.3 billion in federal funds coming to the states. Um, well, not coming to the states, but that will be available to people soon. Um, it'll offer up to $50 a month for broadband subsidy um, and a $100 device discount. Um, 
So uh, eligibility is there. The program is not up and running yet, but we anticipate it should be up and running very soon. Um, you know, folks have said it should be available by April um, and uh, it'll be available until all of that 3.3 billion is expended. Um, uh, or six months after the end of the health emergency. Additional federal relief, and I know I've gone through a lot of program details and your heads might be spinning, but let me spin them a little bit more because we have some more uh, relief coming. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't signed up for our webinar next week to come, I'll dive into some of the federal programs uh, a little bit in more detail um, and uh, we'll kind of tease out some more of these program rules. Um, but coming soon, the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. This was funding that has been allocated both in December through the Consolidated Appropriations Bill um, and additional funny funding through the American Rescue uh, Plan. Um, we are waiting for federal HHS to release allocations and program guidelines. Um, we understand it'll be modeled on LIHEAP, uh, so it'll look very similar to the program uh, that's run for heating assistance, uh, but will be available for water and wastewater. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, there's also, as I mentioned before, additional emergency rental and utility assistance coming. We think that'll be about $671 million for Pennsylvania. Um, and of course, there's some obligation requirements, so we've got to be spending this money and getting out to people. And then last, I'll note that there's the Homeowner Assistance Fund coming. Uh, this was just shy of $10 billion. Um, funds will be available until 2025 um, once they're made available. Um, the allocations to the state, I don't have an estimate for you because it depends on unemployment rates, foreclosure rates, and the number of uh, people in the state be, that are 30 days plus behind uh, on their mortgage. So, uh, but it will include electric, gas, home energy, water, internet. Um, so uh, we'll cover the utilities for homeowners. We're just not sure how quickly uh, this program will make it to the states. So we're hopeful it'll be here soon. That we'll have more details for you to share with you uh, any day. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague from CLS, Kintasia Scott, to uh, talk about um, some termination defense strategies. Thank you, Liz. Hi, everyone. My name is Kintasia Scott. Um, as Liz mentioned, I'm an attorney in the energy unit at CLS, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some reconnection and termination strategies. I'll first start with this short video, which is specific to Philadelphia, but the process is generally applicable um, to all utilities that are regulated um, across the state. What to do if you receive a shutoff notice? By law, PICO and PGW must send you a shutoff notice by mail 10 days before they actually shut off your electric or gas service. Here are some ways to help you keep your gas and electricity on when you receive a shutoff notice. Contact your utility to find out if you are eligible for their bill affordability program. PICO's program is called CAP. PGW's program is called CRP. If you have previously been on CAP or CRP, ask the utility if there's a catch-up or a cure amount that you can pay to get back on the program. Check to see if there is grant assistance available to cover some or all of your bill. LIHEAP the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program is available through the Welfare Office during the winter months, generally from early November to early April. Grant assistance is also available through the Utility Emergency Services Fund, or USEF. Ask PICO or PGW whether they will give you a payment arrangement on the balance in order to break up the amount you owe into more affordable payments. If you already have a payment arrangement, ask if there is a catch-up amount you can pay in order to get back on track. 
only agree to a payment arrangement that you know you are able to afford, as the number of payment arrangements you can get are limited. If you disagree with the amount that you owe, do not agree to a payment arrangement. File a complaint instead. If someone in your household has a serious illness or medical condition, contact the utility and let them know. You may be eligible for a medical certificate, a form signed by your doctor that will give you a 30-day hold on the shutoff. After you're approved, you can extend this hold by getting up to two renewal certificates. If you pay all of the new charges that you are billed while on a medical certificate, you could be eligible for additional certificates. If you believe the utility has improperly billed you or otherwise violated your rights, you can file a complaint with the Public Utility Commission. You cannot be shut off while the PUC looks into your complaint, but you will still be responsible for paying undisputed bills. Call the Bureau of Consumer Services at 1-800-692-7380. If you owe a lot of money and cannot get an affordable agreement, you may want to file for bankruptcy. Contact an attorney to discuss whether bankruptcy is a good option for you. If you need legal help or advice, contact Community Legal Services. Come to walk-in hours Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 a.m. to noon at either our Center City or North Philly office. Or find self-help materials on our website at clsphila.org slash get help slash utilities. Thank you, Maddie. Um, so that just gives a broad overview of some of the things that we will keep talking about in the upcoming slides. So next slide. Termination requirements. As previously mentioned, the moratorium on utility shutoffs does end tomorrow, as well as the winter moratorium. And some clients across the state may have already started to receive some notices um, from each of the utilities about an int intent to shut off or a shut off notice. So general termination notice requirements, there is a 10 day notice requirement from that each of the customers must receive. And that 10 day notice is valid for up to 60 days. So a client may not get shut off right at the 10 day mark, but that is sufficient notice. There is a three day notice the utility must attempt to contact the customer via phone, electronically if they've had the customer's consent, or in person. And then finally, there's the last knock, which happens immediately prior to shut off. There are some additional notice requirements uh, for tenants. So if the bill is in the name of the landlord, there is a 37-day notice to the landlord and a 30-day notice that must be given to tenants. This notice must allow for the tenant to pay the last 30 days of service to prevent termination, and tenants can deduct this amount of the payment from their rent, and they are protected from retaliation. This, um, this protection for tenants applies to both regulated and unregulated utilities. Next slide. So here are a few strategies to um, avoid termination or reconnect. First, apply for all of the available assistance programs. As Liz mentioned a little earlier, um, be sure to inform the utility that the application is pending um, and also ask to stay the termination while the application is pending. If the client is experiencing a unique hardship, make sure to inform the utility as a additional assistance or special protections may be available. Two, ask for the security deposit to be released and or waived. If clients are at a certain level of the federal poverty level, so if they're at or below 150%, no security deposit may be charged for the household. Number three, if ineligible for assistance or the assistance is insufficient, the client should seek an affordable payment arrangement from the utility or the PUC. This will also allow the utility 
for the PUC to assess whether, um, um, you know, that they have additional assistance that may be available for the client. You should also assess whether there are some other special protections that may be applicable to um, certain populations of vulnerable consumers, such as the medical certificate, which we will talk a little um, in a little more detail about in a couple of slides. For those who are um, survivors of domestic violence, they may be entitled to additional protections. So um, those with uh, protection from abuse orders or other similar court order orders, um, they cannot be held liable for debt accrued by a third party, and they also have the right to additional flexible payment arrangements. And if you have any questions about this specifically, specifically please reach out to either Pulp or CLS and we can help you um, navigate some strategies for each of these. Um, and then number four, refer to your local legal services providers to access to assess other legal options such as bankruptcy. Next slide, payment arrangements. So a payment arrangement is an agreement to accept liability for debt and pay it in one or more payments over a period of time. Do not accept liability for debt that you do not agree that you owe. So if there's a dispute about the amount, do not accept the payment arrangement. And also do not accept a payment arrangement that you cannot afford to pay. Utility issued payment arrangements. Um, each of the utilities have broad discretion to enter into reasonable payment arrangements. Consumers also have the right to negotiate for a better payment arrangement. Um, our advice is to avoid the IVR or automated payment arrangements, which are not based on household income. So if you call into the utility um, and while you're in the um, when you're dialing in, they may have the option um, to, you know, select for a payment arrangement without talking to a representative. You should generally avoid those and speak to a representative. Um, as we mentioned before, the moratorium on utility shutoffs will be ending tomorrow and the commission's order lifting that moratorium. There were some additional terms that all utilities must comply with. So until December 31st, 2021, all utilities must offer the follow, following payment arrangement terms based on household income. So there's a minimum of the 60 month payment arrangements to customers with income at or below 250% of the federal poverty level. There's a minimum of 24 months for those who are between 250 and 300% of the federal poverty level. There's a minimum of 12 months for those who are um, over 300% of the federal poverty level. And for small businesses, there's a minimum of, of 18 months. Um, and I'd just like to know that these are, you know, new terms for both the utilities and advocates. So if you and a client are having issues working through negotiating an affordable payment arrangement, you can reach out to CLS or Pulp. Um, for assistance with these issues. The next slide we're talking about PUC issued payment arrangements. So the Public Utility Commission can generally issue one payment arrangement and can only order a second if the household has a significant change in income. In general, those who are enrolled in customer assistance programs those customers are not eligible for payment arrangements for debt accrued while they are enrolled in those programs. However, the payment arrangements can be extended if a household has a significant change in income. In regards to current customers, those who are on or who were terminated at the same address within 30 days, the PUC can generally issue one payment arrangement based on the income here, 60 months for those at or below 150, 24 months for those between 150 and 250, 12 months for those between 250 and 300, and six months for those over 300. 
And I know this is a lot, so please, um, uh, this presentation will be sent out at a later date. So if you'd like to know more um, specifics, um, you can review then. Payment arrangements for a reconnection. So this payment arrangement includes a reconnection fee, which is cost-based plus the payment arrangement. And that um, payment arrangement term is for 24 months for those who are at or below 150% of the FBL and 12 months for those who are between 151 and 300% of the FPL. Um, important to note that a full payment may be required if the customer defaulted on two or more payment arrangements. Um, an additional caveat, there are temporary PUC issued payment arrangement terms. So until December 31st, 2021, the PUC can issue one payment arrangement for residential customers um, for a minimum of 60 months for those at or below 250% of the federal poverty level, 24 months for those between 251 and 300, and 12 months for those over 300. It kind of mirrors the terms that utility um, utilities can offer. There can also be one additional payment arrangement for those who have previously defaulted on a PUC issued payment arrangement, regardless of whether there was a change of income. Um, and there's also one 18 month payment arrangement available for small business customers. Um, it is unclear at this time if CAP customers can get this utility issued payment arrangement. Next slide, Maddie. Medical certificates or med certs. A household may obtain a medical certificate to stop termination if a household member has a serious illness or a medical condition which requires utility service to treat the condition. The decision to issue this medical certificate lies at the discretion of the physician, physician assistants, or a nurse practitioner. The medical certificate temporarily stops termination for 30 days. Um, and the certifying professional must provide a written certificate within three days. Um, the customer can also submit a new certificate every 30 days if they continue to pay the current charges by the due date. And a customer may renew these medical certificates two times, so they have about 90 days of protections even if they do not pay the current charges by the due date. Um, and just to note here, there is no need for medical certificates if other protections from termination applies. Um, if you have questions about, you know, which strategy, um, which, you know, program to use for assistance, once again, please reach out to CLS and Pulp and we can help you work through those issues. Um, and here is a short video on ten. Before we quite start that, I just want to make sure because we're going to run short on time and I want to make sure everybody knows that while uh, this training has been ongoing, we received notice from DHS that they've extended the LIHEAP season through April 30th. So how is that for live um, uh, updates? But breaking news, um, DHS did decide to extend the program through the end of April. Um, so uh, that's wonderful. And uh, excuse the interruption. No worries. Thank you, Liz. Um, Maddie, you can go ahead and play the video. The purpose of this video is to explain a tenant's rights and protections against utility shutoffs. If your landlord is responsible for the gas, electric, or water bill, but stopped paying the utility company, the utility company is required to give you a chance to stop service from being turned off. If your utility bill is in your landlord's name, you may not be terminated for the landlord's failure to pay without sufficient notice even if you fail to pay rent. Self-help eviction is illegal. A landlord generally may not ask a utility to turn off service to a tenant's home. If they do ask, the utility must provide the tenant with the right to keep service on. Landlords may not retaliate against tenants who exercise utility rights. Tenants whose landlords have failed to pay the utility bill have the right to deduct the amount paid to the utility company from their future rent payments. If the landlord retaliates by filing for eviction, you have the right to file a countersuit for two months rent's payment or the actual damages sustained 
whichever is greater, the cost of suit and reasonable attorney's fees. Additionally, the landlord cannot begin an eviction action or raise the rent if the tenant reports a foreign load. Foreign load is when you are being charged for any utility costs of other tenants or common areas. However, foreign load only applies to public utility commission regulated utilities. If you suspect the utility meter to your apartment is also powering another residence or unit or a common space in the building, you have the right to ask the utility company to investigate. If there is a foreign load, the utility will put the bill in the landlord's name until the wiring or plumbing has been corrected. If a landlord stops paying the utility bill, the company must notify the landlord at least 37 days before turning off service, as well as notify tenants at least 30 days before turning off service and of their right to receive continued service if the tenant pays the amount equal to the most recent 30-day bill to prevent shutoff of the utility service. And the landlord must give the names and addresses of any affected tenants. Tenants are not required to pay the past due balance. If the tenant pays the amount equal to the most recent 30-day bill after the termination notice, the utility company must restore service. The tenant may continue to pay the monthly bill and deduct that amount from the rent. For more information, visit Pennsylvania Utility Law Project at rhls.org slash PULP or email utilityhotline at palegalaid.net. If you live in Allegheny, Beaver, Butler, or Lawrence Counties, you can request free legal services at Neighborhood Legal Services by calling 1-866-761-6572. And thank you to Neighborhood Legal Services for helping us put together that helpful video on tenants' rights. Just wanted to take a brief second to, to thank them for that. Thank you, Maddie. Um, next slide. Um, if you have any questions about the any the purpose tenants' of this rights, week. please reach out once again to CLS or Pulp, and we can be of assistance with that. Um, we're running a little short on time, so um, this is our last um, big piece of advocacy. So the utility complaint process, um, the customer must first attempt to resolve the issue with the utility. Um, our suggestion is when you do call the utility with a dispute, you can have the customer literally say the words, I'd like to initiate a dispute so that the utility gives them a determination about their investigation. And then if the customer is not satisfied with the utility's um, determination, then our suggestion is to file an informal complaint with the PUC. So this informal complaint is uh, investigated by the Bureau of Consumer Services or BCS. Uh, the decision is not presidential. Um, it will temporarily stop termination if it's filed at least 24 hours before the termination is scheduled to occur. If an informal complaint is denied, customer may file a formal complaint and the customer is still responsible for paying undisputed bills while the informal complaint is pending. The formal complaint process requires formal a, a formal written complaint and it involves a hearing before an administrative law judge. And if you have um, questions about what that process looks like, there's a link there to the PUC's website um, and CLS and Pulp may be able to assist you uh, with thinking through some of those strategies as well. Um, Liz, where are you going to go? I can go through this. If not, sure. Um, I hear that you have uh, some sirens in the background, so I mean, <laughs> no, 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 this is. <laughs> Um, just to, you know, some resources, as Kandeja said, the utility company is the first place to contact um, if somebody's behind. And uh, as she, you talked about earlier, um, you know, the very first line of defense is to apply for these assistance programs. The, there's a long, you know, a line of other resources there. Um, and I'll just note for Pulp, uh, do, uh, you know, contact us. Um, our e shared email address, pulp at palegalaid.net, will go to the whole team. Um, and so we'll try to answer your questions in the field uh, as quickly as possible. Please don't send individual clients to that email address for assistance. 
can send them to our emergency hotline, um, uh, but you can always reach out to us if you need technical assistance as you're assisting other consumers. Um, I, uh, you know, can't encourage you enough to uh, refer people to the local legal services programs uh, who are your local first line of defense um, for these kinds of uh, assistance. And then if you're working with consumers that are struggling, that are over income for assistance from legal services, the Office of Consumer Advocate is also a resource. Um, and I do wonder if, if the other folks on the team can help me identify some of these good questions that are coming in. There's so many really good questions um, uh, about appeals, right? Uh, is there a right to appeal for the ERAP determination? Yes, there is a right to appeal and information about appellate rights. Um, uh, if there's an adverse decision or somebody gets denied for ERAP, uh, there is a process for that and uh, information was put in the answers. Um, what are some of the other questions um, that uh, folks think we should prioritize here in the last couple minutes. Um, there's so many good ones. Um, I Liz, do want to, yeah. Um, I see a question and, and um, that I don't know the answer to. So um, it was the one barrier we are encountering with the administration of ERAP is the amount of assistance. If utilities and rent are paid in the same month, it counts as one month. However, if utilities are paid in one month, but not rent, this counts towards the 12 month total assistance. Is, has there been any discussion on expanding this up to 12 months of utility and up to 12 months of rent? That's a really good question. And I haven't seen guidance on that that um, uh, requires that reading. Um, so uh, it's a really good flag um, and something I can talk with the folks at DHS. I think some of them are on this call. So, um, uh, you know, noted that, that that's an issue. And I think we need to, to work to see if we can get some guidance out about whether it's two look backs, one 12 month look back for rent and one 12 month look back for utilities. I would say I have yet to read anything in the, the authorizing legislation that would have restricted it to a single 12 month look back for rent and utilities together. Another question um, that that I see that, that I think would be useful to answer is, um, are any utilities adopting a stance or is there a legal requirement that will hold off on disconnection if there is proof a customer has applied for ERAP? There is no requirement, but I will say that I would encourage you all to reach out to the utilities. <laughs> this is, um, you know, I think the folks that I work with at the utilities don't want to shut people off. Um, uh, so I would encourage you to make that connection with the utility and to see if they would hold off. And that's where the recommendation to snap a picture and note the date that you submit the application, because um, that may help to convince them that there is funding coming. Because ultimately, the utility doesn't make out if somebody is disconnected. They make out if, if uh, somebody pays their bill, right? So if there's funding that's going to come, uh, all the better. And if you need a direct contact at the utility, is reach out to us and we will try to connect you with the right person. Great. Thank you so much uh, for this absolutely wonderful uh, presentation. We are absolutely lucky to be working with such wonderful partners. Uh, again, the emails are on the screen. We encourage you to reach out and to reach out often with your questions thoughts and um, please make sure that you fill out the survey that will be sent and remember we will uh, make a list of all these questions and and uh, try to get them answered as soon as possible. We hope you have a great day and uh, try to enjoy some of the sunshine if you have some sunshine. Thank you. <laughs>